This episode of Untold Stories is underwritten by Lee County Government, County Commission, and the Baron Collier Jr. Foundation. Tales of fabulous fishing were already luring anglers to southwest Florida when a single sensational catch near Punta Rasa revolutionized sport fishing. One of the most glorious sights I know is the dashing action of a tarpon when hooked. He shoots straight out of the water with rolling eye and shaking with fury. The tarpon then with mighty power goes off in one rush, perhaps a hundred yards without stopping. In 1885, Southwest Florida became the center of a celebrated new sport when the first tarpon ever taken with a rod and reel and not harpooned was caught near Punta Rasa by Mr. W.H. Wood of New York City. Wood's fishing feat made headlines around the world and the London Observer predicted, Sportsmen may yet go to Florida for the tarpon as they now go to the Arctic zone for reindeer walrus and muskox another reporter raved these fish are to the water what the lion is to the jungle and they are just as difficult to bag to land one means to engage in a thrilling jewel and ever the skill of the fisherman is pitted against the prowess of a mighty fish the promise of a thrilling duel with a fierce fighting fish lured avid anglers to southwest florida in search of the shiny scaled sensation but traveling to the distant kingdom of the newly crowned Silver King of Game Fish required time and money. So in order to get down here from the major cities up north, what they would have to do is come down by rail, and it took them a couple days to get down to Tampa or to Punta Gorda. And the contemporary descriptions of Punta Gorda in the early 1890s are a grand hotel surrounded by 12 shacks. Most anglers moved on taking the steamer to St. James City or Punta Rasa in the heart of Tarpon Territory. In Punta Rasa, sportsmen desperate for accommodations persuaded George Schultz, manager of the cable station, to rent out rooms in the ramshackle building a former army barracks built during the Seminole Wars. Schultz shrewdly saw the potential of his rough resort and added more rooms, naming his makeshift inn the Tarpon House. When W.H. Wood caught that first tarpon, things really took off. Uh, he had a special gallery for millionaires of the day uh, called Murderer's Row, and they particularly liked staying with Schultz because they could go down to his telegraph office and buy and sell stocks in New York. Well-known visitors to Schultz's rustic retreat included inventor Thomas Edison. Edison came in 1885, and at the time he was looking for a place for a winter home. He loved the outdoors, was very interested in plants, and actually was a fisherman by that time, and arrived at the time that the fishing for tarpon craze really hit our area. Edison did not catch a tarpon of record on his first visit. He did spend $2,750 to buy 13 acres on the river and built a pier so that he could fish whenever he wanted to. Edison later wrote, the finest tarpon fishing in the world is right in front of my house in Florida. An illustration in Harper's Weekly, drawn by Western artist Frederick Remington, stirred even more interest in the silver-sided bucking bronco of the seas. Women soon joined the tarpon fishing fraternity, assured by guidebook writers that catching a wily tarpon required more brains than brawn. It is more like chess than fishing. Strength avails little, for the light rod is no restraint on the powerful tarpon. The creature must be made to tire itself out and do the chief work in its own capture. The No Frills Tarpon House soon faced competition from the San Carlos Hotel in St. James City and the elegant Yuseppa Inn, built by streetcar tycoon John Roach to cater to an elite group of devoted anglers. The walls of the inn's trophy room were eventually covered with large tarpon scales on which were written the name of the angler, the weight of the fish, 
and the date of its capture. In addition to taking souvenir scales, many anglers taxidermied their trophies. When gazing at a hundred-pound tarpon, which is certainly rather below than above the average weight of the fish, one finds difficulty in believing that it's been captured with rod and reel. By 1902, the handful of hotels couldn't keep up with the growing number of tarpon hunters, and the San Carlos Hotel began offering rooms aboard its floating hotel, anchored conveniently close to Captiva Pass. Other wealthy anglers stayed on board their own yachts for the busy winter fishing season. Although anglers came prepared with fine bamboo rods and reels fitted with linen line, tarpon hunters quickly learned the value of local knowledge. There is, of course, a considerable choice in guides, and it is important for a novice to get a skillful boatman who knows the grounds. The people who fish for tarpon in, in the early days all fished with guides. The guide manned a rowboat, which generally was towed to one of the Gulf Passes behind a steamer. They'd tow a whole string of rowboats with a guide in each boat, and the guide would come up to the steamer, pick up his client for the day, and then off they'd go in the rowboat. Local commercial fishermen eagerly served as boatmen and guides. The commercial fishermen made more frequently off of guiding these northern tourists just a few times a year than they would on all their commercial fishing the rest of the year. For instance, in 1891, in an article in Century Magazine, it was said that the average northern tourist on this coast among these islands spent $500 for every tarpon he caught. Even with a guide, catching one of the fascinating, frustrating fish wasn't easy. Suddenly, my guide called and I turned to see his line running out so rapidly that the handle of the reel knocked a piece out of his forefinger. He reached me the rod, and then ensued a long uphill fight, which I can compare only to a hand-to-hand -hand tussle with a wild beast. The old reels were revolving spools, but the handles were direct drive. Those things spun crazily when a tarpon was zipping line off the reel, and there was a lot of skin lost to those wildly spinning handles. This is a Edward Vomhoff reel, which is turn of the century, and it's all made of German silver, and it's got Bakelite sides. And as this handle's spinning at 25 miles an hour, it actually makes a humming noise. And if you're trying to fight a fish and your hand gets caught on that handle, you can break your bones in your finger. After landing a knuckle-busting 210-pound tarpon using a leather thumb pad reel, New York reel maker Edward Flumhoff invented the star drag reel, patented in 1902 and still in use today for big game fishing. So with that star drag eliminated that the turning of the handle and it basically stood still and the line could be released. The fish bites the line, the line spool comes out as fast as 25, 30 miles an hour and the handle never moves. Although the Silver King reigned supreme, anglers quickly discovered other game in the fish-rich waters of southwest Florida. They were interested in, uh, in trout and in mackerel and uh, other types of fish that were easily caught, like redfish and snook. A manta ray or devilfish, you didn't catch them, you harpooned them. They were considered trophies, and it was something that uh, was very impressive when you took a picture of yourself uh, next to one that you had uh, landed because uh, they were so big. The big and bizarre were fair game, and anglers eagerly sought Southwest Florida's oddities, bagging everything from giant sawfish to sharks. While some of the big game fish were edible, few visiting anglers acquired a taste for tarpon. Some persons consider it exceedingly palatable, but for my part, I prefer something more delicate. The crews of the sponging and fishing vessels dry large quantities of it. When thoroughly dried, it bears a close resemblance to smoked buffalo meat. Tarpon was still king in 1911 when Baron Gift Collier bought Yuseppa Island and founded the Isaac Walton Club, named after the 17th century English author of The Complete Angler. The club became one of the leading and most exclusive fishing clubs in the country, and its trophies and tarpon buttons were highly prized. A silver button was given to the angler who caught the first tarpon of the season. 
a gold button was issued for a 100-pound tarpon, and a prestigious diamond button was awarded for tarpons weighing more than 150 pounds. Despite a seemingly endless supply of fish, by 1911, sportsmen were becoming concerned about the senseless slaughter of so many silver kings. Don't murder your game. To object to taking a tarpon for mounting or other rational purpose would be fanatical. But to wantonly slay the beautiful, harmless creatures that have so contributed to your pleasure is not only cruel, but it is unfair to your fellow sportsmen. The Isaac Walton Club took this message to heart and became one of the first fishing clubs to promote catch and release. By the 1920s, Southwest Florida was the preferred playground of the tarpon hunting gentry. The really big glory days started in the 1920s and 30s for tarpon fishing in this coast. And in those days, the magnificent tarpon fishing tournaments and the lodges like Gasparilla Inn on Boca Grande, the Collier Inn at Yuseppa Island, and of course also the Tarpon Lodge right here on Pine Island catered to those northern fishermen. The roster of rich and famous anglers included President Herbert Hoover and Western writer Zane Gray, who stayed on Yuseppa Island and later wrote about his fishing adventures in Tales of Southern Rivers. The renowned angler and storyteller thrilled readers with his descriptions of the Silver King. A grand blazing fish leaped into the sunlight. He just cleared the water and seemed to hang for an instant in the air. The wide gill covers slapped open, exposing red. He shook with such tremendous power and rapidity that he blurred in my sight. I saw the bait go flying far. He had thrown the hook. Keeping a tarpon hooked, or even getting a bite, was tricky business. The finicky fish took both live bait and lures and kept tarpon hunters constantly guessing. Manufactured lures for tarpon and other game fish promised success for a price. This is the Florida Shiner and these were made in the Orlando, Florida area. These were probably made in the late 20s, early 30s. They used it for freshwater bass and for snook and for tarpon. It kind of evolved to be quite a lure. These are made of wood and they're hand carved to make a mouth opening in the front. These are called surprise minnows. So basically when you pulled them, it created a splash coming out the sides of the mouth and it looked like a wounded fish. Even back then, let's say in the 1920s or 30s, you're spending 75 cents or a dollar on a lure. That's equivalent to paying $10 to $15 now for lures. Homemade lures offered a cheaper alternative. They would just buy broomstick blanks and cut those down into lure size and then turn them and make shapes into lures and paint them from there. One of the baits that they used for fishing back in those days was handmade. They used a Panama roller or an olive shell and they would saw off the tip of the shell and they would pour lead into it and you cast with them. And the pompano and the mackerel loved them and you'd catch redfish on them too. You get a line, I'll get a pole, honey. You get a line, I'll get a pole, babe. You get a line, I'll get a pole. We'll go down to the crawdad hole, honey. Babe of mine. Woo! While lures and bait were critical, having a boat was not. Bridges and piers offered fine fishing, and by the 1940s, the Naples Pier was a renowned fishing spot. There was a lot of different species that included sawfish, several species of shark, big hammerheads, a lot of giant goliath grouper, which they called them jewfish in those days. They would range three, four hundred pounds, some of them. Trout, ladyfish, uh, blue runner, jacks, flounder. There was a lot of flounder in our area in those days. Your mullet season in the winter months was really something to see. They would be so thick, I'm not exaggerating, you could actually snitch them with one hook. If you use a triple hook, you could get 50, 60, 100 pounds in no time at all in a gunny sack, take them and sell them. By the late 1940s, a well-earned reputation for fabulous fishing was luring a record number of tourists to southwest Florida in search of the Silver King and the big three, snook, spotted sea trout, and redfish. But fishing was no longer a rich man's sport. 
and the rising tide of tourists was beginning to take its toll. The end of World War II when the recreation craze really kicked in and conservation was really a concern because there were so many people starting to fish and they started to see a little decrease in the amount of fish that were in the waters. Well, snook took a hit real, they were probably the first species that really got noticed because there was so much activity on them, both sport fishing. When you say sport fishing, really a lot of us were little bitty commercial fishermen because we were selling our catch. So we were as guilty as they were, uh, help depleting them, just not as much as large a scale, of course, but more anglers kept coming. So the total body count for the snook moved up and up and up. In 1957, the Florida State Legislature declared snook a game fish and prohibited its sale. But snook and other sport fish faced other threats as well. Slowly, there were more and more people fishing for snook, but it also coincided with the mosquito control. When they, when they started spraying by plane, they were using a chemical that we knew had to be the reason why we were seeing a decline. When we were drifting the passes and those planes came over and we looked at the surface of the water, there was a film on it. Not only was there a film, but all of a sudden all these little glass minnows were flipping over. I mean, you just see dead fish. Then you come to find out that snook lava flowed to the surface. Well, what was happening, the mosquito spray was killing the snook lava. Despite the first warning signs of trouble, sport fishing continued to flourish, and the Silver Kings now shared the royal dais with a feisty freshwater species largemouth bass. Bass are distributed in every single pond, ditch, and creek in the state of Florida. And there's tens of thousands, I'm going to say at least 10,000 anglers a day are fishing for bass the whole year. Snook were also gaining preeminence as a prize game fish, despite declines and new regulations. The main requested fish at that period of time was snook. To this day, the snook is a magical word. Our policy was this, your limit of snook or four hours, whichever came first. Now at that time we only took two people, but we also counted ourselves in the limit. The average trip in the 60s lasted two and a half hours. Now I'm talking 12 capable snook in two and a half hours. It used to take longer to get the bait than it did to get our limit of snook. Offshore anglers also found plenty of fish. You could go just outside the pass, maybe a quarter of a mile, and all you had to do was just start drift fishing. That's all you had to do. And you catch one grouper right after another and you, until you got tired or caught all you wanted. And you can't do that now. Sport fishing has changed a tremendous amount in the fact that what I've seen, we went in the early 60s to absolutely no, no control over a fishing game. I mean, there were liberal limits and you could keep all the snook and tarpon, and there was just, there was any, wasn't any, hardly any regulation on bass. Without any regulation, tarpon continued to be killed for weight records and trophy mounts. Like most fishing clubs, the Fort Myers Beach Tarpon Hunters Club required members to bring in their catch. It used to uh, be a, a total kill club. You had to bring in that fish. It had to be hooked up on, uh, not a scale specifically, but hanging there on a hook for the count. A long time ago, we used to bring in the whole fish to the taxidermist because they made what was called a skin mount. So they needed the whole fish. Well then, with the advent of fiberglass, all they needed were the fins. So we would cut the fins off, drag the fish out, and dump them. I felt sorry for the snook. I felt worse about killing tarpon. Magnificent fish like that, and just for the fins, Oh boy, so now I'm, I'm bringing in a little plastic bag that's costing this guy $600. Tarpon populations began to plunge, and in 1989, anglers were required to buy a kill tag to keep a Silver King. For $50, a person could buy a tag that gave them the right to kill a tarpon. And many years before that, about 1,500 tarpon a year were killed at Boca Grande for the purpose of mounting. After that, there never were more than 100 tarpon tags turned in and statewide. Uh, so it was just a night and day difference. 
there's no reason to kill a tarpon unless you've got a world record going. And it's like anything else, whether it's tarpon, snook, redfish, uh, you want them there, you know, to fight another day, to be there for future generations. New gadgets and quicker boats also began to take their toll on fish populations. And we have better electronics, and with the advent of GPS, you can pinpoint your spot within a yard. With the good expanded depth finders, you can differentiate between the mud bottoms and sand bottoms. You can see where the fish are. Everything is really to the fisherman's advantage. You might say, well, what, what does the fish have as an advantage? You know, when you look at all the millions of places they can still hide, there is still a looking game. The game of fishing is finding the fish. By the early 1990s, finding the fish was becoming increasingly difficult, and sport anglers and commercial fishermen began to blame each other for declining catches. What happened was that all of a sudden there was a big market in Japan for row, for mullet row. Now what that did was, because it was so profitable, it brought mullet fishermen down from Louisiana out of state. During the row season, a mullet fisherman could earn $25,000 in just one week, launching a frenzied gold rush for the fancy fish eggs. When you put out a mullet net, it's indiscriminate. It could be anything in the net. It could be snook. And because everybody was so snook conscious that they were saying that the mullet fishermen are killing all the snook. Sport anglers banded together and launched the Ban the Nets campaign. We tried to talk to some people about instead of the net ban, maybe doing something more innovative, like limiting so many tons of mullet caught a year. And it got to the point to where it was obvious that neither side was gonna back off. They just were not gonna back off, period. When it was proposed, I was still a member of the Florida House of Representatives. It never passed the Florida House of Representatives and probably never would have. But in 1994, voters overwhelmingly approved an amendment to the state's constitution that banned most entanglement nets. After the net ban came into effect, all the guides and everybody, oh man, now we're gonna have fish coming out of our ears. Never happened. There was no increase in game fish. Now, the net ban has been in effect quite a number of years. The fishing is still going downhill. So what the heck did the net ban do? The net ban didn't do anything. It just put a bunch of people out of business. The regulation is another case of using the sledgehammer to kill a net. Today, the net ban and other fishing regulations continue to stir controversy among anglers many, many species in the Gulf that are overfished and, or in the process of being overfished. And that's just through, pretty much through mismanagement. They've done ridiculous things like they had for Red Snapper a 32-year rebuilding plan. Uh, you know, so who's going to be held accountable for that when it doesn't work? You know, not anybody that's working there now. <laughs> Silly stuff. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I'm optimistic on the whole. I think the more people that care about fishing, the better off fish are going to be. Other anglers aren't so optimistic. I'm like the guy that found religion, you know? I really am when it comes to snook. I wish they would just close it for five years. Let them get a chance to, to restock. You're taking a chance on killing a certain percentage of snook by catch and release. So why do it? You're killing the golden goose. You used to years ago be able to do what they would coin as there were acres of tarpon. You could walk across them. Haven't seen that in years. There's different opinions on why that's happened. I feel some of it with the red tide has killed the bait. If the tarpon don't have food, they're going to move somewhere else. The fishing today is a shadow of what it was.
It's a combination of a lot of things. It's not just one thing. It's just not overfishing. It has a lot to do with the environment, just like when they let all that fresh water out of the lake. Look what happened then. The whole environment of, of the lower and the sandable changed. The chemicals have a lot to do with it. You know, the spraying years ago had a lot to do with it. You can't pinpoint one thing and say that's the cause. It's an accumulation of a lot of different things. And of course, the, the amount of people that fish now, it's incredible. The population's growing. And as it grows and grows and grows, there's a certain percentage of people are gonna buy boats and become anglers. One of these days, maybe another 50 years, why you'll be drawing a lottery and see what day you can use your boat. That's how serious it is. To purchase a copy of this and other WGCU-produced programs, go to WGCU.org or call 1-888-824-0030. This program was produced for the citizens of Southwest Florida by WGCU Public Media. Show your appreciation for programs like these. Become a member of WGCU, a business supporter, or leave a legacy through a state or planned gift. Call or visit our website at WGCU.org.